Here we are, still in chapter 23, and this is part two. We're going to get down to the nitty gritty and talk about exactly what the renal tubules are doing. So remember we have the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, and then in between them we have the loop of Henle. So each of these has a function, and then after we leave the distal convoluted tubule, we get into the collecting ducts. So this slide is talking about the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. And it's using two words, reabsorption and secretion. And this is confusing if you don't think about it for just a second. So you have these tubes, look like hollow spaghetti, and as the uh, plasma runs through them, some of the stuff is reabsorbed. So it leaves the tube, so it's not going to exit the body as urine. So being reabsorbed means being put back into the body. So you take it out of the tube and send it to the uh, nearby blood vessels that are waiting to reabsorb the nutrients. Tubular secretion, on the other hand, is actually taking stuff that's in the body outside the tubules and putting it into the tubule so that it will be added to the fluid that is going to be your urine that comes out. So when you see the word tubular secretion, think there's something entering the tube from outside the tube. So that's really confusing when you run across it for the first time. So I want to make sure that everybody's cool with what tubular secretion is. The reabsorption kind of makes sense. You absorb it back out of the tubule and put it back into the body. One of the most disheartening things that I know of is looking up how many calories you burn when you walk a mile. And it's a l around 60 calories. So if you drink a Coke, like a little 12-ounce Coke, the little can, not one of those nice big ones that you get when you go through the drive through it would you would have to walk three miles to burn off one can of Coke. But while you're just sitting around watching TV or playing on Facebook or studying for your anatomy class, you're using up 6% of the ATP in your body just making pee. So you're just working. So if somebody says, what are you doing? Just sitting around being lazy and being a couch potato, it's like, oh no, I'm working really, really hard burning up ATP, making urine. So the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be absorbing 65% of the goodies that are coming out of the glomerulus. So remember in our last lecture, we talked about the Bowman's capsule, which is kind of like the, the glove on a, of a pitcher's mitt. And then the glomerulus is a wad of capillaries that fits inside of that uh, glove, the Bowman's capsule. And the blood that goes by drops off the plasma. It doesn't drop off the formed elements or red blood cells or white blood cells, just the plasma. And now, as you go into the proximal convoluted tubule, you're going to absorb most of the good stuff and put it back into the body. So you've got to get the amino acids out and the glucose out, um, necessary vitamins, necessary sodium and potassium, and things like that. So also, the proximal convoluted tubule is going to take some substances from the blood that you do not want to have in the blood, and it's going to secrete them into the tubule. So the proximal convoluted tubule is really, really busy. It's got microvilli to increase the surface area, and then it's got all these mitochondria just working like crazy to do active transport. So it's secreting and reabsorbing at the same time. So that's kind of cool. 
If you remember back to first semester when you learned about tight junctions and desmosomes and things like that, when we talk about the bladder, we're going to talk about tight junctions because when you put urine into the bladder, you don't want it leaking out. So you want the cells held together very tightly. So you have a lot of proteins. It's kind of like they're Velcroed together very tightly. So you're not going to have fluid leaking out of the bladder into your body. But up in the proximal convoluted tubule, I do want to have leaky areas. So in between the epithelial cells, they are not tight junctions. They, are, they will allow significant amounts of water to, to leave. So I'm going to put it back in my body. So remember, you're going to process so many liters of fluid through these tubules. And you're only going to make one to two liters of urine a day. So most of the water has to go back into the body. So by being leaky between the cells, you're able to take that water. But you also can pass things through the epithelial cells that are making up these tubules. So you have this active transport going through. You bring it into the cytoplasm, and then you can push it out the other side. So the reabsorbed fluid, that that leaks out, is ultimately taken up by the paratubular capillaries. And in case you forgot what the paratubular capillaries are, here is the proximal and the distal convoluted tubules. And there, all around there, are the paratubular capillaries. So as it's ejected, as it's reabsorbed, as it is sent out of the tubules, then these capillaries are tasked with picking up the stuff, the water and the salt, any of those things, the glucose, and putting it back into the body. So there's your paratubular capillaries. And then, of course, you've got the vasorecta, too, along here. There are several places in your body that you have sodium-potassium pumps. So when we talked about the nervous system, we talked about sodium-potassium pumps. And when we talked about muscles, we did it. And now we're down into the tubules inside of the kidneys, inside the nephrons, and we are having sodium-potassium pumps. So you want to pump some of that sodium back out and then allow some of it to leave in the urine. So there, the sodium that's pumped out, that's reabsorbed, is picked up by the paratubular capillaries. And again, don't forget the role of aldosterone in the whole sodium-potassium thing. We always talk about sodium-potassium, but you need to know that chlorine's tagging along. It's kind of like that annoying little brother or little sister that just tags along behind you. So we don't talk about it. We just know that it's going to go along with it just by electrical attraction. We talked about leaky cells. So your sodium, excuse me, your potassium and magnesium and phosphate are going to be able to go between the cells along with the water. So they're dissolved in the water and they, they re-enter and are picked back up by the paratubular capillaries. You also have some of your phosphate that is transported along with the sodium. So sodium is probably going to go through the cells mostly and these others are going to go between the cells. Now remember that calcium can hang out on large proteins, so a lot of times it doesn't even come into the filtrate. It just goes on with the red blood cells and the white blood cells and leaves the glomerulus without entering Bowman's capsule. But some calcium that does make it in there goes into the um, proximal convoluted tubule. And then, but most of it is absorbed later on in the nephron. So as we're going through, away from the proximal and going down to the loop of Henle, we're going to be taking out more of the calcium. And glucose is also co-transported. So you've got phosphate co-transported with the sodium. Glucose is co-transported with the sodium, excuse me, for the sodium. 
And remember, unless you're diabetic, all the sugar will be reabsorbed. You should not find sugar in your urine. If you do, it is a signal that you are having um, diabetes. So this slide is trying to put everything that we've talked about together in one slide. So it shows you how these cells are held together, but fluid can pass through and dissolved in that fluid are many other things. The sodium, potassium, chlorine, magnesium, calcium, uh, phosphate, urea, uric acid, those can also go through here. And some of it is absorbed by the paratubular capillaries. Other things are actively transported through the cells. So there's some of your chlorine. So you have chlorine that passes through here, but some that's also transported along with the sodium through the cells using ATP. So glucose is too big. It has to be transported across. So you're going to be using up ATP energy to do that. To get it across. Earlier we talked about different nitrogen containing compounds and how nitrogen in high concentration is toxic in the body. So you're going to absorb some of the urea, about half of the urea. You want to keep it in your body. You don't want to get rid of it. And uric acid you're going to reabsorb some of that, and then if you reabsorb too much, you're going to secrete it back into the nephron, and it will join with the other things that are going to leave the body as urine. So you reabsorb it, but if you reabsorb too much, you're going to secrete it back into the tubule later on. And you're going to find out why. This is kind of a clever and neat, but anyway, I'm... I'm uh, spoiling the story. All right, spoiler alert. Creatinine is not reabsorbed. It will stay in the tubules. You don't have a mechanism to pull it back into the body, and it's passed out in the urine. So we use that to figure out how well your kidneys are filtering. This slide is a little bit of a summary. We've already talked about you have about 180 liters of plasma that passes through the kidneys each day and most of that is reabsorbed and sent back to the body with only one to two liters coming out as urine. So we uh, pull most of the water back in our body and we pull most of the stuff that's in the, the filtrate, the glomerular filtrate, back into the body. Most of this takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule but more of it takes place down in the um, loop of Henley, or the nephron loop, as they're calling it in this textbook. Now, here's the important thing. If you remember osmosis, osmosis is where you have a semi-permeable membrane. So it means that some things can pass through and some things can't. Well, we've been looking at pictures of how the sodium potassium pump allows some things to pass through the membrane. Then we talked about some things that can just diffuse freely through a membrane. Anything that's fat soluble can go through. So we've been talking about uh, semi-permeable membranes and what can go through and what cannot go through. Now, if you're looking at one side of the semipermeable membrane and the other side of the semipermeable membrane, you need to look at the stuff that's there. Now, I use the word stuff because it's a whole mouthful to say the sodium, the potassium, the magnesium, and the urea, and uric acid, and all of that. So instead of having me list off all the things that could be on either side of the membrane, I'm just going to say stuff. And in your mind, you just go through and you, you recite all that stuff. All right. If there is more stuff on the inside, then we say the cell is hypertonic. So hyper means too much. Like if you're hyperactive, you have too much activity. And sometimes they say you have a hypoactive thyroid gland, meaning it doesn't perform enough. Hypo is not enough. 
hypoglycemic, not enough sugar. So you've used the words hypo and hyper before. You should be very familiar with those words. So you need to know on which side of the membrane is hyper and on which side of the membrane is hypo. Which one's got more stuff? Well, on this slide, they're telling us because the proximal convoluted tubule is doing such a great job in reabsorbing um, all of that stuff, it's going to make the tissues around the tubules and the cells of the tubules hypertonic. So they've got more stuff in them. They've got more potassium, more sodium, all of that stuff. So they're hypertonic. Wherever you have a hypertonic region, water will flow in that direction. The example that I usually use is if you take, if, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this before, but slugs will get in your garden and they'll eat everything. So most people do not want slugs on their plants. You don't want to go out and find your tomatoes are all ruined because the slugs are crawling around them and eating holes in them. So when people see slugs, they'll sprinkle them with salt. Well, salt is stuff. And slugs, when you put the salt on them, the water goes towards the stuff and so literally, when you put salt on a slug, it sucks the water right out of the slug, which kills it. Because you have to have uh, water in your body. Now, I can't sprinkle salt on you and get the same effect because you have a waterproof layer of keratin on the outside of you. So you're, you're basically waterproof, and, and the salt sprinkling on you will just fall off. But if you've ever seen a slug, they're wet. They have to secrete fluids in order to be able to crawl around. And so putting salt on them just sucks the fluid right out of them. So the salt is hypertonic and the slug is hypotonic because it doesn't have as much stuff. And water always goes in the hypertonic direction. So you're trying to dilute out the hyper stuff. So in this case, because you are taking the stuff out of the tubules and putting it in the tubule cells or on the other side of the tubules where the tissue is outside and where you've got those paratubular capillaries, that area is going to be hypertonic. And anywhere it's hypertonic, water will be attracted to that area. So if you can remember, hypertonic is where there's more stuff. And if you can remember that water always goes in the direction of the stuff, water always goes in the hypertonic direction, then you understand osmosis. Now, if you remember when we were talking about the glomerulus and we were talking about the afferent arteriole coming in and it's larger, so in comes the blood into those capillaries that make up the glomerulus. And because the capillaries are very, very leaky, the fluid is pushed out and caught by the Bowman's capsule and sent to the proximal convoluted tubule. So I've said that a number of times. Hopefully I'm pounding it into your head. But we didn't stop and think, well, what happens to the blood when you take the plasma away? Well, it becomes very, very concentrated. So you have a lot of stuff there. You have red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and all that albumin with all the stuff that's stuck on the albumin. So you're going to make the blood that is inside the efferent, remember exiting the efferent arteriole, it's going to be very, very Concert. It's going to be very hypertonic. So because it is hypertonic, it's going to be wanting fluid to be sucked into it. So as you are pushing the water out of the proximal convoluted tubule, you've got the blood that just left the glomerulus 
that is super high concentrated with stuff. And so the water is going to be sucked back in. And this is good because you want to keep the blood from getting too concentrated. Because if blood gets too concentrated, it can start clotting. So we don't want that to happen. So we suck the water right back out of the proximal convoluted tubule and we send it over and it goes back into those uh, uh, capillaries that feed into the um, efferent system that's going back to the heart. Here's an overview of angiotensin II and its effect on the glomerulus and on the tubules. So if you have angiotensin II that comes into the area, this is like a double negative. It reduces resistance. So if you re reduce resistance, then you increase tubular reabsorption. So the net result of angiotensin II, it will constrict these afferent and efferent arterioles, so not as much blood can go through, and it's going to make less urine volume, but you're going to have highly concentrated urine. So angiotensin II is going to cut down on the urine volume, but what does come out as urine will be more concentrated. Now, whenever you get uh, urinalysis, you pee in a cup, and they look at various things. One of the things that they look at is called specific gravity. So if you're looking at water, we're going to say its specific gravity is 1. Now, if you add stuff to the water, if you add urea, uric acid, creatinine, things like that, uh, salt to the water, it's going to become thicker. It's going to become, there's going to be stuff dissolved in it. And so the specific gravity is going to be 1 point something, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. So the more concentrated your urine is, first of all, it's going to look a lot more yellow. So if you have low specific gravity, your urine is going to be a very pale yellow. But if you have absorbed most of the water out and have a high concentration of things in your urine, it's going to become more and more yellow colored. And so it's going to have a higher specific gravity. So when you're looking at your urinalysis results and they tell you and they give you the specific gravity, it's just how much stuff is dissolved in your urine or how concentrated your urine is. We've talked about ways that things can spill out in the urine that you don't want to spill out in the urine. If you've got too much salt, if you've got too much glucose, if you've got too much of anything, you only have a certain number of transport proteins that can take stuff across the membrane. So if you've got more than that, then you're just going to pee it out in your urine because you can't take it up. You don't have the ability. You don't have, you've saturated the um, transporters that are trying to pull it out of the fluid that's running through the tubules. Any blood glucose above 220 is going to mean that you're going to have glucose spilling out in your urine. So there's a fancy way of saying that. Now, most of us, once we eat a meal, we do go up this high, but we make insulin, we secrete insulin, and we pull the sugar back out of the bloodstream so that the kidneys don't uh, pee it out. But again, diabetics don't have enough insulin or they don't have enough receptors for the insulin to work and so they keep a high level of sugar in the bloodstream and so you end up having some of it come out in your urine. 
So we've talked about some of the stuff that's removed that we have to get out of our blood, urea, uric acid, bile acid, ammonia, and even some a little extra creatinine, which we're going to secrete into the tubule. So we got to get rid of this stuff. So you're going to add it to the tubule. You're also going to uh, get rid of hydrogen if you have too much hydrogen because you have to maintain your body at a certain pH. So we talked about that when we talked about homeostasis. We need to have a very narrow range of pH in our body. So we can't, we can't tolerate too much of a change. So the kidneys can get rid of too much hydrogen, too much bicarbonate, too much carbon dioxide, stuff like that. To, to keep us at homeostasis. But the other thing that you also put into your urine, you also secrete into the tubules, would be things like morphine, penicillin, aspirin. So a lot of the medicines that you take come out in your urine. So because your kidneys are so great at filtering it, there are a lot of medicines you have to take multiple times a day Otherwise, the kidneys will just, you'll just pee it all out. So uh, anyone who's ever been on like a morphine pump, you know that about every four hours you get another shot of morphine because most of it is cleared from your body within four hours. And same thing with penicillin. You have to take it usually about four times a day. If you look on the bottle of aspirin, it says take every four to six hours. And that's because you're going to be peeing it out. So we spent several slides talking about how much of the stuff that we pull out, we reabsorb, we get back out of the glomerular filtrate. So we started out with basically plasma, and then we pulled out the sugar because we've got to keep that, and we, keep, we pulled out a lot of the sodium and the potassium, and a lot of the calcium. So if you stop and think, we're pulling all this stuff out. We're reabsorbing it, and we're putting it outside the tubule. So what's left inside the tubule is mostly water. So the tubular fluid is very dilute. So you, you have the proximal convoluted tubule. It's just busy sucking out water. It's busy sucking out nutrients and things. And then you're going to go down the loop of Henle. And as you go through, we'll go back and talk about the loop of Henle in detail in just a second. But as you go down and then you come back up, by the time you get to the distal convoluted tubule, before you go into the collecting duct, you mostly just have a very dilute fluid. It's basically just water because you suck most of the stuff out of it. So we started out with like 180 liters of plasma, of filtrate in the glomerulus, going through these uh, nephrons, going through the proximal convoluted tubules, distal, all of that. And you're going to suck out most of the water and most of the nutrients but you're still going to have about 36 liters of urine that you would pass if you just stopped right there with just the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule. So you're going to find out that the collecting ducts are going to pull out a whole bunch more of the water. And we're going to find out how they do it in just a second. There are hormones that can also directly affect the collecting duct. So aldosterone works on it, atrial natriuretic peptide, antidiuretic hormone, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and then the parathyroid hormone. So these are just some of the hormones that are going to act on the um, distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct and cause you to either leave the water in there so you pee it out or pull the water back into the body 
So you've got to get this 36 liters down to about 1 to 2 liters before it leaves the collecting duct and goes into the bladder. So remember, aldosterone is the salt-retaining hormone. It keeps you from peeing out your salt. And if you don't pee out your salt, the water will stay with the salt, so you're also not going to pee out your water either. So aldosterone helps you if your sodium concentration falls, if you have too much potassium, if your blood pressure drops, Maybe you've had an injury, you've had surgery, something that caused you to bleed and your blood pressure is dropping. So any of these things are going to cause renin to be released, which is going to cause angiotensin 1, which is going to cause angiotensin 2, and then you're going to cause the adrenal cortex, the outer part of the adrenal gland, to secrete aldosterone. So when you see aldosterone, just say in your mind, oh, that's the one that holds salt in your body. That's the one that holds salt in your body. So to understand this slide, think about what would happen if you made too much aldosterone. And there are tumors of the adrenal cortex that cause you to secrete too much aldosterone. So these people are going to reabsorb way too much sodium and their blood pressure is going to shoot up and they're going to secrete too much potassium. They're going to pee out too much potassium in their urine and so they're going to start having heart problems. They're going to start having cramps in their legs, ticks in their eyes, things like that. So if you can think about what would happen if you had hyper aldosteronism it'll help you like I said understand what's going on in this particular slide another of the hormones that's going to act on the collecting ducts and on the distal convoluted tubule is natur natriuretic peptide can't even talk tonight natriuretic peptide this natria natrium is sodium so everyone else in the world calls sodium natrium, but Americans call it sodium. But the abbreviation for natrium is Na. And so the sodium peptide is secreted by the muscle of the heart. So myocardium, muscle, heart of the atria. So it's the top part of the heart. And if you have high blood pressure, it's going to cause this myocardium to secrete this natriuretic peptide or salt peptide or sodium peptide, however you would like to keep it in your mind. So what's going to happen here? If you have this natriuretic peptide secreted by the uh, myocardium, all right, you need to fix high blood pressure. So how can you fix high blood pressure? Well, one of the things, you can get rid of salt and you can get rid of water. So you're going to have less blood volume. So that's going to drop your blood pressure right there. But another thing that it does besides making you pee out more salt and more water, it will open up the afferent arteriole. It dilates it. And it will constrict the efferent. So you can do one thing to the afferent and do a different thing to the efferent. So now more can go into the glomerulus, but less can come out. And so what's going to happen is you're going to push more fluid out of the glomerulus. It's going to be caught by the Bowman's capsule, and it's going to be sent over to the proximal convoluted tubule. So natriuretic pep peptide is going to cause you to get rid of salt and water. And in one of the ways it does it is by opening up the afferent arterial and allowing more fluid to be pushed out through the glomerulus. Another thing it does is it shuts down renin 
and it shuts down aldosterone. So with renin shut down, you're not going to make angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and you're not going to have aldosterone stimulated in the cortex of the adrenal gland. It also inhibits antidiuretic hormone. Now, antidiuretic hormone is, is one of those things you have to stop and think about. Okay, so diuretic, a diuretic makes you pee. An anti-diuretic makes you not pee. So if you inhibit the anti-diuretic hormone, it's going to cause you to pee more. So you have to stop and think about that for a minute. Okay, diuretic makes you pee. Anti-diuretic makes you not pee. So if I put this peptide, the natriuretic peptide, into the bloodstream and it goes down to the kidneys, it's going to block the secretion of antidiuretic hormone. So you're going to pee more. All right, so I said it twice, and you're going to have to go through it yourself until you've got it. It also is going to keep salt from being reabsorbed by the collecting duct. So it forces the sodium to stay in the collecting duct. And because the salt is there, the water is going to go there too. And so you're going to pee more. So this is the heart's way of making high blood pressure drop. If you remember back when we were talking about the endocrine system and we were talking about hormones, we talked about the posterior pituitary and we talked about the anterior pituitary. And antidiuretic hormone is secreted by the posterior pituitary. So anytime you're dehydrated, if you have loss of blood volume, uh, if your blood becomes too thick, you got too much stuff in your blood, so you have high blood osmolarity. That means you got too much stuff in your blood. All of these things are going to cause the arterial baroreceptors and the hypothalamus to release antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so this is going to prevent you from peeing out your water. It's against um, diuresis or against peeing, anti. All right. The collecting duct becomes more permeable to water. So water is going to rush out of the collecting duct and back into the body where you can reabsorb it. As you get older, your body can't handle milk very well. Most people, as they get older, they if they drink milk or they eat ice cream, they're going to get bloated, they're going to get gassy, they're going to feel yucky. Some people even get nauseous if they eat too much ice cream. Others, they have diarrhea if they drink milk. So we call this lactose intolerance. Um, in some severe cases, people actually have asthma attacks from having um, being unable to break down the sugar that's in milk. So for this reason, a lot of people, uh, who, as they get older, they have less and less things that have cheese, less and less things that have milk. And why is this important? Well, not only do you have your, your cutting things that have calcium out of your diet, but as you get older, your hormones drop off, and so you don't have the hormones to put the calcium back into your bones. So a good high percentage of people as you get older have osteoporosis and they're literally dissolving their bones away because they're trying to get calcium into their body. So if you 
are older, you need to stop and think about what you're eating and make sure that you're getting calcium in your diet. So calcium is essential. And if you don't get it in your diet, you'll literally dissolve your bones away to get the calcium. So besides old people who, who don't want to drink milk or eat ice cream or have anything that, that's going to give them gas and prob, you know digestive problems, you also have pregnant people who have a little baby inside of there. And we always think, well, babies are so sweet and precious. They're little parasites. They're just like a tapeworm almost in that they attach to your body and the food that you put in your bloodstream, they're going to grab it first. They're going to get it because they need it to build their body. So if you're not drinking enough milk, if you're not getting enough calcium in your diet, the baby will dissolve your bones in order to get the calcium that it needs to build its body. So People who don't have good prenatal care, they don't take prenatal vitamins and they don't take calcium supplements and they don't drink milk like they ought to, a lot of times their, their jawbone will actually dissolve to the point where their teeth fall out. So if you go into areas of where there's a lot of poverty, you'll see a lot of the women that have had children have lost their teeth. Because literally, the baby has dissolved away their bones to get the calcium. So, you have, on the back of your thyroid gland, you have the parathyroids. And they secrete parathyroid hormone if you have a calcium deficiency. So, it might be a deficiency because you just aren't putting calcium in your body. It could be because you're old and your hormones aren't helping you with building strong bones anymore, and you have osteoporosis. Whatever the reason is that you don't have enough calcium in your body, you're going to have the parathyroid hormone saying, hmm, we've got to have calcium, because without calcium, your heart won't beat, your muscles won't work, so you've got to have calcium in your body. So it will act in the kidneys, and help you keep the calcium ions, but it also will dissolve away your bones. So this slide says that the parathyroid hormone causes the phosphate to be excreted, to get rid of it. It also increases calcium reabsorption. So you're getting rid of phosphate and you're keeping the calcium. If you want the calcium to go into your bones, to build your bones up, you have to have the phosphate. So because you got rid of the phosphate in the urine, the calcium is going to stay in your bloodstream rather than going into the bones. So in order to go into the bones, calcium needs phosphate. But you just peed it out because the parathyroid hormone told you to. So this is going to increase the amount of calcium that's available to your body in your bloodstream. For those of you who are interested in statistics, I just went and looked it up. A fourth of all women over the age of 65 have osteoporosis. So one out of every four have osteoporosis. That is where their bones have dissolved to the point where their bones very easily break. They're going to have hip fractures. They're going to fall. Men, because they have testosterone a little bit longer than women do, are less likely to have bone fractures. They're less likely to have osteoporosis. But the older you get, the more osteoporosis there is. So by the time a woman is 75, you've got something like 37% of all the women. So you're getting close to almost half the people as you get older have osteoporosis. Sometimes I get on my little soapbox and I preach a little bit. And one of the things that horrifies me is that 
doctors and nurses are taught that old people don't need hormones. It's normal for them not to have hormones. And I'm going, what? You replace thyroid hormone if you don't have thyroid hormone. You replace insulin if you don't have insulin hormone. So why in the world would you not uh, give older people the hormones they need to prevent osteoporosis? But they're taught in medical school, no, 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 old people don't need hormones. It's normal for them not to have hormones. So anyway, I'm stepping back off my my soapbox. I'm going back to talking about urine. Earlier we talked about the different sizes of nephrons. You've got some of the nephrons where you have the Bowman's capsule and the proximal convoluted tubule and then the loop of Henle and then the distal convoluted tubule. The loop of Henle is so short that it mostly stays in the cortex. So about 85% of all of them are short. But we're going to be looking at the ones that are long, the juxtaglomerular nephrons. And we're going to look at what happens when it, the loop of Henle is allowed to dip down into the medulla and then come back up again. But oddly enough, this book talks about what happens in the collecting duct, and then it goes back and talks about the loop of Henley, which it should do it the other way around because it doesn't make as much sense, but that's okay. So in the cortex, if you look at the stuff that's outside the tubules, it makes up about 300 milliosmoles per liter of fluid. So someone sat down and looked at all the stuff. So here I'm going to talk about stuff again. You've got sodium and potassium. You've got salt and amino acids. You've got all that other stuff. And they look at how much water attraction it has, and they rate it. So they rate this ability to suck up water as 300 milliosmoles. Now, if the fluid inside the tubule is 300 milliosmoles and the fluid outside the tubule is 300 milliosmoles, water is neither going to go in or out. So it's an equilibrium. It's isotonic. But if the fluid inside the tubule is 300 milliosmoles, and you descend down into the medulla, the medulla becomes more and more salty. It becomes more and more, it has more uric acid, it has more urea, it has more stuff out here in the medulla. And remember, water always goes towards the stuff. So earlier we had talked about the 180 liters of fluid that leaks out of the afferent arteriole, goes into Bowman's capsule, and is processed. By the time you make it through this whole thing and all the way through here, and you make it over to the collecting duct, if you, let, if you just peed it out right then, you'd pee out about 36 liters which obviously we can't afford to do that because then you'd have to drink 36 liters of water every day to replace the fluids that you lost. So your collecting duct is going to pass down through the medulla. So not all of your loops of Henley go down into the medulla, but all of your collecting ducts do go down through the medulla. So as you were pulling salts, out of the loop of Henley and out of the uh, convoluted tubules and all of that, you're going to get more and more salty. You're going to get more and more stuff outside the tubules. So here is, in the cortical region, you have about 300. Once you get down into the medulla, you double that. You have about 600. So now, 
as the urine, which is only about 300, comes down, you're going to be sucking that water out. Because it's 300 in here and 600 out there, so the water is going to go definitely in this direction because the medulla is very hypertonic. And then as you go even further down and further down in the medulla, now you're up to 900 milliosmoles. So it doesn't matter what the stuff is, it's the stuff that is able to pull water is out there. And then by the time you get deep in the medulla, you're up to 1,200 milliosmoles, four times more than what the the uh, fluid is in the cortex. So you're, that's how you're going to be able to pull out the extra 36, well, 34 liters of fluid so that you only pee out one to two liters. So it's very important to understand that the medulla is very salty or very, has a lot of stuff. So a lot of it is salt, but a lot of it's urea and other stuff. So as you go deeper in the medulla, it becomes more, it has more and more milliosmoles of stuff out there, and it's going to cause the water to be sucked out of the collecting duct. So by the time you get your urine, it's going to be about four times more concentrated than the plasma that you started with. Now, one of the questions the students always ask me is, if you're in a boat in the ocean, why can't you drink your own urine? Well, because it's four times as concentrated. So even though you drink your urine, you are getting some fluid into your body, but you've got so much stuff in it, so much toxic nitrogen waste, and the salt that you don't need, that it's going to go into the kidneys at a higher rate. It's going to be more than 30 osmoles. And you're going to try and concentrate it. So you can drink your urine at least once, maybe twice, but you can't keep drinking your urine. And, of course, the, the ocean is salty. So if you drink salt water, you don't have any way of of concentrating and pulling the water back into your body because your 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 um, too much salt is dissolved in the glomerular filtrate in your plasma, so it it won't work. However, if you're ever out in the desert and you are dying of thirst. Two places you can get water. One of them is in your car radiator. A lot of people are sitting there right there by their car, and the radiator is full of water, and they die of thirst. Right there by a great big container full of water. The other thing is, if you open up a cactus, inside is, it's full of water. So just a little aside there in case you're ever caught and you need water. If you drink way too much water, that's okay. You're going to pee more, and it's going to be more dilute. So your urine can be extremely concentrated, but you can also get down to like 50 milliosmoles per liter. So remember we talked about 300 starting out? So you can dilute it, but you have to drink a lot of water. If you're dehydrated, you're going to have very hypertonic urine. So a person who's dehydrated, they're not going to pee as much, but what they do pee is going to be deeply, deeply yellow because it's very, very concentrated. So this is not a good thing because if your urine is hypertonic, then it also means your plasma is hypertonic. And if your plasma is hypertonic, it's going to shrivel up your red blood cells so you're not going to be as efficient in carrying oxygen. People who get dehydrated, a lot of times they get uh, disoriented. 
So if you're not thinking clearly, if you feel kind of dizzy and weird, if you go drink some water, sometimes that fixes your problem, oddly enough. People who get sick with the flu and they don't they can't get out of bed to get a glass of water whenever they need it, often get dehydrated and start having some uh, mental issues or uh, brain fog. And that's a new word that they're using now, brain fog. So dehydration, you can tell that you're dehydrated usually by looking down at your fingers. If they look shriveled up, you don't have enough water in your body. A lot of times when you are hungry, it's your, it's your body misinterpreting the signal. So you might not really be hungry. You might just be thirsty. But your body's like, I don't know, I'm getting this weird signal. I guess I need to go eat something. So a lot of times just drinking some fluids, rehydrating yourself. And you all know that if you go out into the sun and you exercise too much, you're working in the garden or you're whatever, and you get too much heat, without enough water, then you can get heat stroke. So you've probably heard of that. So you do need to keep hydrated, but you, it, it is especially important for the kidneys. Nowadays, most people give tests as multiple choice. It's easier for the students because all they have to do is just look at the word and find the one the correct word, and they don't have to think about what is the correct word because it's written down on the piece of paper for them. But as you get further up into college classes, you're going to have more and more essays. So if you're taking a more advanced physiology course, instead of giving you, you know, A is this, B is this, C is this, and you choose one of those, it'll say, explain the countercurrent multiplier of the nephron. So you're almost guaranteed to see that question. In fact, when I was applying for the job for teaching this class, that was one of the questions that they asked me. They said, we need you to explain the countercurrent multiplier of the nephron. So let's talk about that. So you know what a current is. You've got something flowing you have electrical currents, you have the currents in the water, the riptides, and things like that. So the nephron loop, which is actually the loop of Henle, is a countercurrent multiplier. So as you are going through the loop of Henle, you're going to pull the salt out. You're going to pull the water out. And as you go deeper in the renal medulla, as we saw, you're going to pull out more and more. So you have a multiplicative effect. So we went from 300 to 600 to 900 to 1,200. So we multiplied how salty. We multiplied the milliosmolarity as we went down. But now think about what the nephron does. It starts up in the cortex. It dips down into the medulla. And it comes back up out of the medulla. So it's, it says countercurrent because the fluid is flowing in opposite directions in adjacent tubules. So as you're coming down one side, so as you're coming down one side, so here's the proximal, because it's closest to the glomerulus. Here's the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. This one is going to come down, okay, and I am sucking the water out. I am sucking the water out. I'm sucking the water out. Because I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper down into the 1,200 range. And then I'm bringing that same fluid, because it's caught in this tube, I'm bringing this same fluid back up. And as it comes back up, water is going to rush in and dilute that. So coming down 
you're sucking the water out because this is very hypertonic. But as it comes back up, you're putting the water back in. So there's your counter current. Coming down, sucking the water out, coming back up, putting the water back in. Here's the net effect of that. The stuff that's in here as you're sucking the water out, as you come down, becomes more and more concentrated, more and more concentrated, more. And if you're not drinking enough fluids, you can start developing kidney stones because it gets so concentrated that it hardens. And then as it tries to come back up, it doesn't dissolve. So here comes the water pouring back in, pouring back in. And it should dilute the, the waste that was in there. But if it's crystallized, then it can't dissolve it. And so now you have the makings of a kidney stone. All right, so to recap, the multiplier effect is that the, you're constantly bringing the salt back in. This makes the medulla more salty outside the tubules. So you're, you're reabsorbing the salt, putting it into the medulla. The water is coming out into the medulla, trying to dilute because it's so concentrated. And then as you come back up, you put the water back in and you put some of the salt back in. So here's some more pieces of the puzzle that you need to know. When you're coming down the loop for the first time, this is the one that dips down into the medulla, it's very permeable to water. So the water can be sucked out, but salt can't leave. But when you're coming back up, salt can leave. So you can put it back out into the medulla. And you dilute the urine. So by the time you get all the way back up to the top of the loop, you're about 100 milliosmoles. So you started out around 300 milliosmoles. You drop down through the loop of Henley. And you got all the way up to about 1,200 milliosmoles inside the loop. So you've got so much stuff in the loop and you've sucked so much water out that it is super concentrated. But as you come back up, you're going to not be able to put the water back in, but you can take the sodium and the potassium and chlorine and all of that back out into the fluid outside the tubules. So the medulla remains at a high osmolarity because I'm going to put that sodium out there and make it saltier. You're also going to be taking uric acid and urea also, but they're mostly just looking at the sodium and the potassium. And by the time you get all the way back up to the top of the loop of Henle and you're, in, you're towards the distal convoluted tubule, you're back up to 100 uh, milliosmoles. So how does the urea get into the medulla? Not from the loop of Henle. It's mostly through the collecting duct. So let's go back to our picture. We see the water coming out of the collecting duct, but also urea can come out. So that's going to add to the stuff that's out here, the milliosmoles. So that's how you get up to 1,200. So it's not just the sodium and the potassium that come out from the uh, loop of Henley, but it's also from the, con the uh, collecting duct. So this slide is a little bit of a summary of the countercurrent multiplier of the nephron. So we're starting out at 300 milliosmoles. We're coming through the proximal convoluted tubule. We're about to go into the loop of Henle, and you can't see it, but we're now going down into the medulla. So we go from 300 to 400 to 600 
to 900 to 1,200. So we're matching the fluid inside with the fluid outside. So we know that the medulla is about 1,200, and so is the fluid inside the loop of Henle. As we come back up, now we're going to start sending salt out potassium out, and the chlorine is going to follow. So we're going to actively get rid of our salts. And as you do that, you lose the osmolarity, the milliosmoles. So you don't have as much stuff because you're pumping it out. So by the time you get back up, now you're at 100. So you started at 300, came down, pumped out your water, really concentrated it, if I'm teaching this in person and we get down here and people realize how concentrated this gets and how likely you are to crystallize out and make a kidney stone, a lot of times students will get up and go get a drink of water. At this point in time, they're like, oh man, I haven't drunk any water. I do not want that stuff crystallizing out in my, in my uh, loops of Henley. So when that happens, I know I've done a good job explaining how the kidney does its thing and why some people develop kidney stones. So I've gone back to slide number 31, and we're going to look at this again. So as we get into this, we're getting more and more information and hopefully a little bit more understanding about what's going on. So we talked about the countercurrent multiplier, and we talked about how you have this current where this is getting more concentrated and this current where it's becoming less concentrated to where it's actually getting up to where it's 100, starting out at 300. And at the bottom, it's 1,200. But look at the capillaries. We talked about the vasa recta. We talked about the little capillaries that are around the tubules. We talked about the paratubular capillaries, they also have a countercurrent mechanism. So as the blood is going down, you're going to have a concentration of, of the blood, just as you are with the, the loop of Henle. So you've got a countercurrent also going on in the vasa recta which are the capillaries that are surrounding the loop of Henle. Depending on what cells make up the loop of Henle and the cells that make up the capillaries, if you don't have anything that does sodium transport, you're not going to be able to move sodium. So the vasa recta, which is the capillaries coming off the efferent arteriole, it does not remove the sodium and the urea from the medulla. So as we went down, 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 we got all the way to 1,200, these blood vessels, these capillaries that extend down in there, they are not going to pick up that sodium chloride. They're not going to pick up the urea. But you are going to have water changes that are going on in these capillaries. So the net effect is some of the salt does go in as you go down, but some of the salt comes right back out as you go back up. So the net effect is the vasa recta does not change the osmolarity of the medulla. So that's kind of important. So the, the blood vessels themselves aren't changing it. So it leaves the medulla extremely salty and, it, and full of urea. This slide is trying to put everything we've said together in one slide. So we're looking at the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, also known as the nephron tube, the 
proximal, excuse me, distal. So here's proximal, here's distal. And then the collecting ducts. And now you have really, really concentrated urine that's coming down and it's going to go down into the bladder. And then at the same time, these blood vessels that are all around, they're wrapped all around this area, they're wrapped around the collecting duct, they're wrapped around the uh, loop of Henle. You're having water and sodium chloride. Here it is coming in. Water is going in. Salt's coming out. But the overall net effect is it comes in at 300, it leaves at 300. And it leaves the medulla unchanged. So the blood vessels don't have a, an effect. But the collecting duct and the loop of Henley help make the medulla so uh, concentrated with salt and urea and other things that make the milliosmoles go up. And here's a nice summary of everything that we've said. So when I talk about the stuff that's reabsorbed, here's a list of the major things. Your vitamins, your amino acids, tiny proteins. They have to be little tiny, though, because most proteins are not released out of the glomerulus. They stay in the blood. Uric acid, urea, water, magnesium, calcium. So here are the things that I need to keep. I want to pull some of this back in. And I'm going to do most of it in the proximal convoluted tube. Some things that don't come out would be the creatinine. It's going to stay in there. And in fact, I'm going to actually add some more from the nearby blood vessels and put them in and some medicines. So this is a nice overall what is secreted, what is put into the tubule. Remember secretion means to put it into the tubule and reabsorption is what comes out of the tubule and back into the body. So I need to save this stuff and some of this stuff I'm going to add to. Okay. Once I get over into the distal convoluted tubule, there's a few more adjustments I'm going to make. I'm going to tweak the urine just a little bit more. I'm going to change the pH with hydrogen or, um, or bicarbonate right there. And here again, if I have the wrong pH, I can adjust it here. And the urea, I don't want to lose all of my urea. I need it for a variety of things. But one thing I need it for is to keep the medulla salty, to keep the milliosmoles up, to keep it at 1,200 in that range. So I need to put that back and of course I've got to put the water back because I don't want to pee out too much water. So here is a table of some of the things that you should find in the urine. So I've finished going through the counter current multiplier. I've done all this other stuff and I've actually made some urine. So now I'm going to look at the urine. All right we talked about water is having a specific gravity of one Urine can be anywhere from 1, which is very little stuff in it, up to 1.028 grams per milliliter of urine. So this would be very, very dilute urine, almost to the level of water, and this would be rather concentrated. We know that blood is about 300 milliosmoles. Your urine if you're drinking way too much, can be as low as 50 milliosmoles. But if you're really concentrating it and you have a person who's not drinking enough water, your urine can be as high as 1,200 milliosmoles. Your pH range, now your body 
has to be in a very tight pH range. You, you can't live if your blood pH is off by the, the least little bit. So, but it doesn't matter how, what the pH of your urine is. So you can be really acidic, like 4.5, or you can be very alkaline, like 8.2. Most people normally have acidic urine, and that's good. It kills a lot of bacteria, so it keeps you from having infections. The amount of water in your urine is about 95%. This is a normal urine, and about 5% of solutes. So the solutes are urea, salt, potassium, creatinine, uric acid, phosphates, sulfates, a little bit of calcium, a little bit of magnesium, bicarbonate if I need to get rid of some uh, uh, basic, if, I am, if my blood is too basic. And then you have the breakdown of your red blood cells, little pieces of, of un, unrecycled red blood cells. So that's what's normal if I were to look at your urine and look at the various uh, chemicals that are in it. I should not find glucose. I should not find hemoglobin. I can have breakdown products of hemoglobin, but I don't want any free hemoglobin because that would mean that I'm actually losing red blood cells. You definitely don't want to, uh, to see red blood cells or white blood cells. Uh, you, you don't want to see albumin in any kind of levels coming out and ketones that indicates that something bad is going on in your body and bile pigments so one of the things i've mentioned this before and i'm going to mention it again there are a lot of people who are buying into this weird ketone diet and they throw their body into ketosis so that they start burning fat instead of using glucose in their body and it is so unhealthy to do that but you will lose weight before i knew that i was diabetic i just knew that i went to the bathroom and peed a lot and i just it was so frustrating because you had to plan your trips knowing that there there had to be a a restroom nearby and you knew that you couldn't sleep the night through because you're going to have to get up at least once or twice to urinate and I was watching a commercial on TV and it says do you have to get up more than once at night to go to the bathroom and I said yes and it says your problem is an enlarged prostate and I just burst out laughing because Obviously, I'm a female, and I don't have a prostate, so that was not my problem. But most men over the age of 40 have a swollen prostate. It's just one of the fun things that comes along with getting older. And if your prostate swells up, it's going to shut the urethra. So you can't empty your bladder. So you, you pee, and you think, okay, I'm done. I can't get any more urine out. And you, you know, zip up and wash your hands and you walk out of the bathroom and you go, I still need to pee. So there are things that constrict the passageway out and don't allow you to urinate correctly. So kidney disease is going to mess with the, the amount of urine that you make. If you don't drink enough water, if you have kidney stones, uh, if you're in circulatory shock, if you're bleeding out, if your prostate is enlarged. So these are some of the things that are going to uh, change the amount of urine that you release every time that you pee. If you are not peeing at least a half a liter a day, then you're going to lead, you're going to have... Um, uh, nitrogen buildup. So I don't know how many of you guys that are listening have ever gone to the hospital to have surgery or any process where they put you to sleep. But the first thing you hear 
when you wake up, so you're groggy and you're, you're out of it, and you hear this insistent voice, Miss Drake, Miss Drake, can you hear me? Miss Drake, can you pee? Miss Drake, can you pee? And you're just like, what? Go away. I just had surgery. Leave me alone. Miss Drake, I need you to pee. And they won't let you out of the hospital until you pee. So it's that important. You must be able to pee out the waste. And one of the things that happens sometimes when you have surgery or if you are uh, anesthetized is that you have trouble urinating. So they will not release you. And in fact, if you're having trouble urinating, uh, they'll, they'll actually put a catheter in there and let the, the uh, urine drain out of the bladder. So it's not uncommon to wake up after surgery and find out that they put a catheter in you. We've mentioned this before, but I want to hit it one more time. If you have diabetes, type 1 or type 2, it, you're going to have too much glucose in your bloodstream, and you're going to be spilling glucose in your urine. So that's diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus has absolutely nothing to do with sugar at all. Diabetes insipidus is where you don't make enough anti-diuretic hormone, and so you're going to pee too much. So diabetes insipidus, but both of these types, or all three of these types of diabetes, are going to cause you to pee too much. Some common things that you put in your body that affect the amount of urine output is caffeine. It dilates the afferent arteriole, and so you're going to pee more. So everybody who's drunk something with caffeine knows it almost immediately afterwards. You have to go and, and urinate. If you drink alcohol, it actually keeps the uh, tubules from absorbing water and it also blocks antidiuretic hormone so alcohol actually keeps you from releasing this into your bloodstream so if you drink a lot of alcohol you're gonna pee a lot so if you've ever been into a, a lower class bar you there's a smell of urine because the patrons will actually sit there at the bar and drink and urinate right there on the bar still. So hopefully you guys don't go into that kind of bar. And then there are blood pressure medicines that they give you to treat high blood pressure. If you have congestive heart failure, they're going to give you a diuretic. So that's one of the first things that they try if you have high blood pressure, especially if you have uh, some problems with your heart going along with it. We talked earlier about the glomerular filtration rate, or the GFR, and we said that it depends on your race. There are some ethnicities that have a different GFR than others, they usually do it by looking at your creatinine. But they, you can get bad readings if a person has a ptosis, if they have a crimp in the ureter or a crimp in the um, urethra. So, and that will throw off your GFR. So if they really want to know what your true GFR is, they will inject something like inulin, not insulin, but inulin. And it's something that you do not reabsorb or secrete. So they know exactly how much they put into your bloodstream, and they collect your urine, and they see how much of it comes out. And that tells you what your glomerular filtration rate is actually. But most people, you don't have to go to that extreme. They just look and they see you know, how much creatinine's coming out, and they go, okay, your glomerular filtration rate's just fine. 
you are constantly making urine, but you obviously, hopefully, don't have to go to the bathroom constantly. So urination is episodic. You decide when you want to go. And if you're in a job where you don't get to go, you have to, you have to wait for four or five hours. A lot of teachers that are teaching in the elementary and the high school, they can't go except at lunchtime. So all through the morning, they, are, they can't go to the bathroom. And all afternoon, they cannot go to the bathroom. So they, have, they can stretch their bladder to hold more urine. But you're constantly making urine. And it's kind of interesting if you put a catheter in somebody and you watch, you can see the urine as it's made and it drops down through the catheter. So it's not held in the bladder. It just runs out. As it comes out of the kidney, it runs down the ureters, through the bladder, and into the catheter. And so you can watch it going drip, drip. Drip. And you can see how the kidney is making the urine. So that's kind of interesting if you've ever watched somebody who's been catheterized. You do have a flap between the ureter and the bladder so that when you're contracting the bladder in order to urinate, you don't have the urine backing back up the ureter and going back up towards the kidney. So that's a good thing. So you do have this flap of mucosa. If you remember, we talked earlier about the size of the renal pelvis leaving the kidney and then the little teeny tiny ureter. So the opening to the ureter, the lumen or the size of the diameter of the tube is very narrow. So it's very easily uh, blocked by kidney stones. So you may be making urine just fine and it goes into the renal pelvis and it tries to go through the ureter and it can't make it out. So it's backed up into the uh, kidney. And used to, they'd have to go in and surgically remove the kidney stones. But nowadays they have a process called lithotripsy and they actually use sound waves and they shatter the kidney stones if they're not too big. If it's too big, you're still gonna have to do surgery and get it out. But if it's a little one, you can hit it with sound waves and it'll shatter. So if you kind of look at the math of what's going on, the bladder can hold about a half a liter. And if you really, really don't get the opportunity to go to the bathroom, it can hold up to 700 to 800 milliliters. So theoretically, if you do the math, you could actually only go to the bathroom twice a day, maybe three times a day. Because remember, you only pee out from a liter to two liters. So just uh, moderately filling it up is half a liter. Now, I'm going to step on, on my soapbox again, and I'm hoping that sometime someone will get something changed. I am just one voice, but if I tell enough people and you tell enough people and we get this going, we might get this fixed. If you look at where the bladder is, it's up against the uterus in a woman. A lot of women have hysterectomies, so they remove the uterus. Now you don't have a support for the bladder, so you can't fill it. You, you get the urge to pee really quickly because they've removed the support, the uterus that was up against the bladder. So what they're supposed to do whenever they do a hysterectomy is they're supposed to tack the bladder up. So they can attach it to the, one of the nearby bones. And so you can fill it up without feeling like it's full. It's not flopped over on its side. But they don't do that very often. And I asked him, I said, why? Why do you 
doom a woman who's had a hysterectomy to having to go to the bathroom constantly and not being able to fill up their bladder anymore because you've, you've pulled the support out from, from under it. And they said, well, it's because the doctor that does a hysterectomy can't do the tacking up of the bladder. You would have to have a different surgeon who does the urinary surgery. And I thought, oh my goodness. Okay, either send both of them in, have two of them, one of them doing the hysterectomy and the other one tacking the bladder up, or else in medical school say, hey, if you're going to be doing hysterectomies, you may as well learn how to tack the bladder up at the same time. But because it's a different system, they don't do it. So we'll require two surgeons in order to do that. And most of the people doing hysterectomies don't want to mess with it and try to, you know, schedule another surgeon at the same time and deal with all the insurance papers and all of that. And so they just leave the woman who can only fill up her bladder slightly before she has to empty it for the rest of her life. So I just think that that's just mean. So that's one of my things when I step on by my soapbox and I preach. And hopefully they will change this. So here's the structure of the bladder. And you've got the ureters coming in from one kidney and from another kidney. And they have this little area right here they call the trigone region, which is where this ureter comes, this ureter comes, and the urethra comes. So it kind of makes a little triangle there. So there's a, at the bottom of the bladder. And this part is all wrinkled when it's collapsed, but then when you fill it up with urine, then it smooths out. It smooths out. And you have these, um, this muscular layer, it's actually three layers in there that are going to help you squeeze the urine out. And then you have an external urethral sphincter. So this is a female right here. And we have a very short urethra because ours opens out uh, flush with our body. And I think I mentioned earlier that it's very easy for bacteria, especially uh, fecal bacteria, to swim up and give us bladder infections. So that's fairly common, unfortunately, for females. And so I always say, I'm teaching wiping 101. When a woman wipes her bottom after pooping, she needs to wipe backwards. She needs to reach under and pull backwards towards her back. But it's so easy to reach between your legs and wipe forward and what happens then is you rub feces across the anus, and then you rub some on the, um, the perineal region that's between the vagina and the anus. And then you have a little bit of feces that you rub across the opening from your urethra. So women don't really think about that, and especially little kids, they don't know anything about that. They just reach in, they wipe whichever direction. But women should be always taught to wipe backwards. So reach around behind, wipe, and pull up towards the back. So there you go. You learn something, and you can teach your children that so that they don't pull uh, fecal bacteria up inside of their bladder. In the good old days where we actually had face-to-face -face labs and we did lab experiments, one of the things I had my students do was pee in a cup. And we looked, we dipped a little stick in, and we looked to see if they had any protein or if they had any glucose or any of the things that are no-nos that you should not have in your urine. And we took some of the urine and looked at it under the microscope. And most people have some crystals in their urine. But... Of course, if you get too many crystals and the crystals get too big, then we call them kidney stones. So we look to see what kind of crystals, and they each kind of crystal, depending on what it's made from, has a different shape. 
So if you want to Google it, you can look and see all the different kinds of crystals that you can pee out in your urine. So you can have calcium phosphate crystals, you can have calcium oxalate crystals, you can have uric acid crystals, magnesium crystals. So most of them you pee out because you drink enough water to, to flush them out. But some people who don't drink enough uh, are going to end up getting kidney stones. And passage of these kidney stones can tear the ureter. So it's, it's just literally ripping its way as it goes through. And you can have big conversations between people who've had babies and people who've passed kidney stones as to which one is more painful. Other things that can cause you to have kidney stones are if you have too much calcium in your bloodstream. So a lot of people love to take those calcium supplements, but they also get plenty of calcium in the food that they eat. So they have way too much calcium and the kidneys have trouble processing it. So you want to be careful about getting too much of a calcium supplement. We already talked about dehydration. It's going to concentrate stuff as it goes through the loop of Henley and encourage precipitation out in the formation of crystals. If you have a pH problem, if you have urinary tract infections, and here's the one that the guys have to watch out for. Seems like guys have kidney stones more than girls do. And a lot of times it's because they're older and their prostate is enlarged. And so the urine backs up and they have uh, the time to form crystals. There's your picture of kidney stones. So you can see how much fun that would be trying to push that through one of your tubes. If you look at the perineal region of a woman, you're going to find three openings. We have an anus, a vagina, and then our urethra. And above that is our clitoris. For a guy, they run the urethra through the penis. So it's longer, and they only have two openings, just the anus and the opening of the urethra through the penis. The external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle, which means it should be under your voluntary control. So you should not pee unless you want to pee. You should be able to hold the sphincter closed until you get to the bathroom. But if you talk to anybody in a nursing home, if you talk to anybody who's older, they'll tell you that there's a tendency to dribble. So although it should be under voluntary control, it often is uh, not complete. So you start out life in diapers, and a lot of people end up life in diapers. And if you've ever been into an, a nursing home to visit someone or an extended care facility, the smell of urine is everywhere because the people lack uh, they're incontinent. They, they pee when they don't want to pee. And then a lot of people have a problem if they cough, if they sneeze, then they wet themselves. And my favorite is when you're pregnant and you, the baby is using your bladder as a little football. And so they're constantly kicking you in the bladder. And so if they kick you hard enough, you'll wet yourself. So I, I'm always amused when I see that the skeletal muscle is voluntary, and so you should be able to hold the sphincter shut. The female urethra is about an inch long, so three or four centimeters is a little over an inch. And if you look at a man, Theirs is 18 centimeters, which is about 7 inches. So theirs has to go the length of the, of the uh, penis also, so it passes through there. It's not uncommon for little boy babies to be born with the opening of the urethra. Instead of at the end, it's opened out on the side somewhere. 
so they can do surgery when the baby's born and they replumb them so that it comes out the end instead of out of the side. So that's not uncommon. When you learn about the reproductive system, you're going to learn that guys have various glands that they secrete that make up part of the semen. So you have your prostate, and you have your prostate fluid that comes out of there, and then you have your bubble, your urethral gland that makes mucus. And then, of course, you have the epididymis where you have the sperm, and all of that comes down and mixes and forms the semen that the man ejaculates. Now, it's important when the man is ejaculating, so you're having contractions, you're having this, this um, the muscular squeezing, that you want it to squeeze out, and you don't want it to squeeze back up. But sometimes people have a defective uh, uh, flap there, and so when they try to ejaculate this way, it actually squirts back up into the bladder. So that's another a uh, fairly common thing that happens. Because the woman's urethra is only about an inch long, it's very easy for women to get bladder infections. They call them urinary tract infections, or UTIs for short. And if you have sexual intercourse, a lot of times you can push bacteria up the urethra and into the bladder. So that's one of the things that happens, especially, they even have a name for it, the honeymoon disease, where you go on your honeymoon and you have sex so often that it swells the urethra shut and it traps all the bacteria in there. So you end up with a, a, a urinary tract infection on your honeymoon. The proper word for peeing is micturition. And the proper word for chewing is mastication. If you want to amaze people with your big vocabulary, say, excuse me, I have to go micturate, instead of saying, I have to go pee. And when we did the digestive system, we talked about the Valsalva maneuver, which helps you push poop out of the rectum. And if you want to pee, but you don't have a full bladder, then you can use that same Valsalva maneuver and you can press down the diaphragm, which will press down and compress your bladder and you can pee out a little bit. So a lot of people say, well, I can't pee. Well, yes, you can because you're constantly making urine. And if you're constantly making urine, you can push it out. Unless, of course, you have a, an enlarged prostate. One of the interesting things that they do is when you're learning some of the more advanced physio physiology classes is they give you situations and ask you what you would do morally, ethically, legally, medically. And one of them is with hemodialysis. So they were talking about this uh, hemodialysis center where the people who came in had kidney failure because they were heroin addicts. And so morally and ethically, uh, you, you aren't a heroin addict legally because heroin isn't legal. The other thing is, in order to support your habit, you usually have to do things like steal or prostitution, and if you're supporting a heroin habit, unless you happen to be a movie star making millions of dollars, you also can't pay your medical bills. So they were running a clinic to, to do dialysis on people who were heroin addicts, which prolonged their life, which allowed them to go out and commit more crimes, to get more money, to get more heroin, so how is that for an ethical and a moral dilemma? You, you, are you just let them die? They can't pay for the dialysis. And if you do the dialysis, it'll make them feel well enough to go out and get some more heroin. 
So that's one of those things where, of course, nowadays you can't talk about stuff like that because it's not politically correct. But back in the day, that would be one of the things where you would sit down and have long conversations about what would you do in that particular situation. So if your kidneys are not working, what they're going to do is they're going to hook you up to a machine. They're going to pull the blood out, run it through the machine, and they're going to artificially pull the waste out. And then they can return it back to your body, and they're going to pull more out. So they're continuously cleaning your blood for you, doing the job that the kidneys no longer can do for you. So that's called hemodialysis. And you usually have it three or four times a week. And it's extremely expensive. Some of the things that can kill your kidney besides um, heroin is heavy metals. So you've probably heard about little kids eating paint chips from lead paint, and so they get heavy metal poisoning from that. Some people work in factories, and they work with solvents. They work with chemicals that can damage the kidney. Trauma, of course, if you're in a motorcycle accident, your skateboard accident, something like that, that can, that can damage the kidneys that way. If you just keep having kidney infections, kidney infections. So chronic means you just don't get over it. You, you don't get it treated, maybe, or you just keep getting reinfected. Um, if you block the renal tubules because somebody gave you the wrong blood transfusion. If you have a hardening of the arteries, if you have deposits, fatty deposits, blocking your arteries, then you're not going to be able to process the, the plasma through the kidneys very well, especially if it's the arteries that are going into the kidneys. So you can regrow your nephrons to a certain extent, but, um, but if you have too much damage or if you replace it with scar tissue, then you're going to either have to go on dialysis or you're going to have to have a kidney transplant. Now, interestingly enough, you can live with one kidney. And when a lot of people found out that they could live with one kidney, they found strangers, family members, others who needed a kidney transplant, and they gave one of their kidneys to that person. They said, well, I've got two, and I really can make it with just one. And so they, they, they give a kidney. So that's kind of a neat thing. So the last thing I'll say in this chapter is you can survive with one-third of one kidney. So that's how amazing those nephrons are in cleaning our blood. So that's kind of cool. So I hope you learned something and found the urine system was a lot more complex than you thought it was.